Okay, welcome. Thank you. We have Greg on the phone. Greg is calling in. We're going to switch the agenda item around really quickly and go over item number three before item number two so he can pipe in. But we'll start with uh, roll call. Yes, Jeff Morgan. Yes. Vice Chair Abby Hogan here. Director Smith. Here. And I will note that Director Gibbons and Director Sinks are absent today. Terrific. The next item is members of the public are welcome to make any comment that they'd like to on any item not on tonight's agenda. Yes, happy to make a comment. Um, I'm Bruce Carney speaking on behalf of myself, not as a member of any group. Uh, tonight, the Mountain View Environmental Sustainability Task Force is coming to the end of its nine-month mission to develop a series of recommendations to the City of Mountain View to help it achieve its aggressive carbon reduction. And so, you know, as we're playing on the theme of bending the carbon curve that Giresh has formulated, um, we'll be laying out 36 recommendations that we hope that the city will adopt. Um, there's a lot of analysis that went into each of the recommendations. Um, our report is 318 <laughs> tightly written pages long. Um, anyone who reads it gets a prize. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'll be reaching out to the directors of Carbon Free Silicon Valley as individuals if they're interested in getting a one-on-one -on -one update about the recommendations we made, why we made them. They're much more applicable to cities like Mountain View and Sunnyvale than to cities like Los Altos or towns like Los Altos Hills, but there's something in it for everyone. Um, and as far as I know, um, there are some very unique ideas. Um, the one that I think is most Silicon Valley-ish is to embrace the arrival of autonomous electric vehicles but not as a place, a way to get one person from point A to point B, but as a way to get small numbers of people from reasonably closely located starting points to reasonably closely located ending points, which essentially turns an autonomous vehicle into a very small bus. Uh, so if only two people are riding, that could potentially take half of the vehicles off the road. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, but if, if you have, let's say, a seven passenger van and you're able to fill up five seats, then you take 80% of the vehicles off the road. So it has a tremendous amount of potential. The person who wrote that recommendation projects that the cost per rider mile will be 20 cents. So a ride from here to the San Jose airport would cost two bucks. So it, it potentially revolutionizes what we know as public transportation, uh, and it could happen as soon as next year. So that's my three minutes. Thank you, Bruce, and welcome. We're so glad you're here. Uh, the next uh, item is the consent calendar. Approved minutes of the March 27th uh, Executive Committee meeting, which are attached to your packet. Does anybody get any comments or edits on the minutes? Can I have a motion to approve and accept? I move we approve the minutes. Oh, a second. Oh, a second? Yeah. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Anyone abstaining? Okay. Let's go on to item number three, the Super JPA. Okay. All I'll yours. be making that presentation, Chair Corrigan, member of the Exec Committee. Uh, I also have Greg Stepanisich on the phone. Um, he and I have worked on this for a little bit. So uh, we go to the next slide. So in terms of the need, even though we are relatively large, uh, there's a need to, if we want economies of scale, to sometimes act as a larger body. And so uh, we're thinking of this super JPA concept where several CCAs would band together to create a new JPA to deal with needs such as resource adequacy. Over the last year or so, we've seen a lot of uh, that market for resource adequacy is not very transparent, and all CCAs are basically going over, going after that limited resource. So it makes sense to basically take it another level and maybe get this one agency to buy and analyze on our behalf. The Green Book had a lot of um, uh, information, or should I say? Misinformation. <laughs> related to fragmentation and uh, splintering of the industry, this is a way of actually getting some kind of economy of scale. 
Renewable power purchases in bulk, as you buy larger quantities, you can get a break in price. And sometimes that break in price may get up to the 200 to 500 megawatt kind of level. Uh, maybe after about 300 to 500, it starts to level off. But we'll be buying in like 100 megawatt, 200 megawatt blocks. So if we can buy as part of a consortium that's buying in like 500, Megawatts. And just to add to that, the RFO. Is That's okay. exactly right. With the RFO. Between Monterey? Between Monterey and us, yeah, okay. we actually saw that in terms of pricing, where on one of the contracts they said, hey, if you get to 500 megawatts, you will get a break in price. And we are not close to that yet. So getting a larger consortium would be good. Uh, credit, uh, that's an issue. We don't have a credit rating yet. And that's where it comes to, to the extent you have multiple counterparties uh, in an agreement, we could have an improved credit posture from the supplier standpoint. Decarbonization programs. As we move forward in uh, figuring out what our plan is to bend the carbon curve and actually get the implementation, and we're moving into like the mid-market segment of buying in bulk and actually moving the market, uh, Decarbonization program purchases, analysis, design are going to be something we can get benefit. And then other services, like say for example, data management. Today we have Calpine doing data management services for most of us. It's the same kind of service that CCAs across the state are going after. So to the extent we have a group of folks uh, or contract out within a centralized kind of uh, mechanism, uh, we could get some efficiencies there. Next slide, please. So this is a bit of a repetition of the last slide. So from the knee, here's what the scope of what these joint energy programs would be, uh, right from wholesale power transactions to decarbonization <coughs> programs to risk management, scheduling services, etc. Next slide. Uh, actually, go back to the previous slide. So essentially, the way we're looking at this is trying to do it through an a la carte approach. So it's not one size fits all. The agency of the authority would create master enabling agreements that depending on our needs, we could sign up for that. It's similar to a model with Southern California Public Power Authority. It's called SCAPA. All the munis in Southern California have created that kind of JPA. Uh, they are very large uh, and they don't have much staff. The overhead actually works out to be in the single digits. Next slide. Other elements of the JPA. First, the way we're looking at this is you have the JPA enabled agreement. For every project, there'll be a project development agreement with the risk contained within that, a firewall within the project development agreement. So for example, if the first project is, say, a renewable power purchase, say 10 folks are members of this JPA and only three sign up, there'll be an agreement between those three and the risk would be firewall within those three so that it doesn't leak over to uh, other participants in the JPA. So that's what that project risk would be. So the liabilities would be within the project. The board of directors would be the CEA, CEO of each CCA, appointed and removed by each of their boards. Um, all commitments made by the super JPA will have to be basically supported by commitments made by individual CCA boards. So going back to this example of just say we entered into this wind contract, we were one of the three participants. The JPA would sign up with the developer, just say for 500 megawatts. Each of us, so I have to bring that contract to you to say I'll be okay with that. So you're going to have authority of whether we get into the contract or not. So even though the CEO would be on the board, that's on the board to just approve that, that the super JPA getting into that agreement, but the agreement is not complete till we have these offsetting agreements with individual JPAs. 
Debt and liabilities, the liability is limited to member commitments for specific projects. Membership levels, we're thinking of three levels of membership, small, medium, large CCAs, similar to the way we pay dues at CAL CCA. Uh, it works out, right now we're thinking of a zero to hundred million dollars in revenues will be small, hundred to three hundred to two hundred would be medium, and more than two hundred million would be large. Uh, this keeps even cost allocation simple. Sometimes you can get into cost allocation where you're chasing after pennies and you're spending a lot of admin overhead on that. Uh, term, it'll be a, a termination effective when two members execute and can't be terminated until all liabilities have been extinguished. So if we enter into, say, an agreement that's 10 years long, um, a member who's entered into that agreement can't just say, okay, I'm done now. They have to basically, those liabilities uh, are associated with them their time life, their contract. Next. So I just, I was trying to put myself into the head of each of our board members and say, okay, what is the value and what are the risks? So what would the questions that you may ask? <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, on the one hand, on the left here are all the benefits uh, that I've already talked about, but the risks. Once created, JPAs tend to be hard to dissolve. It's just administrative overhead to dissolve it. A question would be, Okay, what about the risk? Say we do a prod, we try to limit uh, risk within a project. What if one of those folks default? Will that liability actually leak past with that firewall be breached and leak over to other members? Would we lose the ability to tailor products and services? So say we're going out for a DCAR kind of study. We may want six things in that study, but not everyone wants those six things, so we may only get four out of the six that we want. So there tends to be trade-offs when you're part of the JPA, uh, that you don't get everything that you want, but uh, that is a risk. And then competition between the new JPA and CCA for services, because we still want to retain control over our destiny and our future. What if we're going out to, say, uh, buy some renewable power on our home, and the super JPA is out at the same time, trying to buy power? Are they going to basically dominate the market? And suddenly, they're this big player there, we're small, and so we don't get as much supply or interest as we get today. Uh, so that's another thing that as we've talked about this idea, it's come up with other folks, also other CCAs have looked at. The footnote kind of I have, there's several of these risks. They can be mitigated via the terms and conditions, but these are, I think, some of the obvious questions one would ask. Next slide, please. So here's the timeline. Uh, the deadline, deadline with the quotes, uh, for providing comments within the CCA community was yesterday. Uh, Greg submitted comments to the attorney who is pulling all this together. Uh, a few CCAs have asked for more time because uh, there's some other things that have been going on in the last couple of months. Uh, Bring it to you today. Uh, I'd like to get your comments today uh, as an exec committee and also putting on maybe your board hat how would you suggest that I present it to the board? Uh, based on your comments today, I plan on taking it to the board July 11th. July and August, all the other CCAs we're gonna be interested in are gonna be providing comments, just like the red lines that we have provided already. Uh, all the risks that I've talked about, we've redlined the draft agreement already and sent that back to uh, the lawyer who's organizing so July, August is going to be a lot of give and take, and then I plan to bring it back to the board in September. We are dark in August. If 
there are enough members of the CCA community who are joining, say three or four, are like, all right, we've resolved these issues, it's good to go, I'll bring it back on September 12th for approval. If there still are issues that are outstanding that require more uh, seat time, it may go to October, November. So I just gave ourselves three to four months of possible back and forth and discussions. So that's the general timeline. And uh, we have, Greg, would you like to add anything to what I said? I know overall, I think uh, that really gives the overview here very well. But definitely happy to answer any more particular questions here. I mean, one thing I could add, though, just in terms of how uh, we, we looked at this initially was, uh, in, in one respect, I think we've, uh, our comments attempted to streamline the agreement a little bit here, because, you know, as a JP agreement, it's more of a constitution with all the details to be worked out after the body is established. At the same time, there were some key areas here that definitely needed to be expanded upon. And, uh, and that include, uh, maybe I should just outline some of those issues that we focused on in our comments, which is number one, what is the actual percentage share that uh, each party would have on a project? And uh, that needs, definitely needs further clarification. We believe that should be based on the financial contribution of each of the parties. And uh, whereas the agreement is wrapped, it seems to be based upon your membership level, and that didn't seem quite right to sit here with respect to, to the participation in a particular project. And then also, you know, what type of security do we have with respect to a defaulting member within a project? And that is definitely a provision that needs a lot more uh, discussion uh, 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 with ourselves and also uh, with the, um, the other uh, potential parties to the uh, agreement. And, uh, and likewise, want to be very clear here too that if any withdrawing party, uh, any party withdraws, that they're going to be still fully obligated with respect to their obligations they have under individual okay. uh, project agreements. Uh, I do think the firewall provisions of a JPA, um, I think that the concept here uh, uh, does seem to be correct that it creates the firewall, so no, no member is liable for the obligations of the JPA unless that member specifically agrees to those obligations. And that's where our obligations therefore would be nailed down to those project um, contracts that we enter into for particular projects that uh, our board decides to uh, to participate in. Uh, so those are that's the overview. I think in terms of this little staff report on the comments received from the other parties, we got ours in yesterday uh, by the deadline. Uh, and MC added some comments in, and uh, but none of the other parties yet have responded. So. Um, uh, at this point, uh, the next meeting of the lawyers will occur in, in July, but uh, that probably won't happen until each of the uh, uh, general counsels reach the parties, finalize their comments, and submit those to uh, uh, to the lawyer who's actually working on the overall JPA agreement. Sure, um, does anybody, any other staff have any other comments they'd like to add to the presentation? Okay, so Nancy and Margaret, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts or questions. Um, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> I, I, it's a really fascinating concept. Um, I think there are definitely some pluses to it. Uh, I guess my question, there are more clarifying questions. That, um, I'll just start off. So was this, you, did you say this was um, offered to all the CCAs yep. in the state? Yep. Okay. And so it's, it'll be a question of how many yes. answers say yes to that. Yes. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm trying to better understand the difference in, in terms of the JPA as opposed to the, it sounds like it's very project specific mm -hmm. in terms of who participates. So what's the, um, I guess, the value add of being a JPA as opposed to, say, you know, or said, RFOs. Yes, if we, uh -huh, if we wanted, we needed someone else to join us to buy, you know, some um, acquire power yeah. to get that wholesale <laughs> economy of scale. Can like, could we just say, okay, Monterey, you know, do you want to join us and mm -hmm. just have that kind of more informal partnership? Nimble. Uh huh. Right. Since um, 
but the JPA, I, I guess it's not really clear on how this works if it's project specific, but you have, let's say, 10 J, you know, members, and then what are the other, and three say they want to join in on a project, what do the other seven do, right? And yeah, what's their liability, what's their responsibility? If there isn't, then what's the point, I guess, is my question. <laughs> so I think fundamentally, if there's a need for collaboration to achieve economies of scale, uh, efficiencies, etc., then the next question becomes, how do you plan to do it? Sure. You can do it through the bilateral approach, which is what we're doing with NBCP, or you can do it through the JPA approach. Uh, what's more efficient? So I think when we, that's where we, yeah. And I think when you look at the array of services that we are going to need mm -hmm. over multiple years, standardizing makes things more efficient. So when you do a bilateral, mm -hmm. everything gets created for that particular project with those parties. Everyone's new every time you come together. But Which, wouldn't that be the same with the JPA anyway if it's project specific? Unless it were set up where the JPA, you know, the board mm -hmm. votes yes or no and majority wins and then everybody's in regardless of whether you voted no. No, so it's not that kind of JPA. It's not a JPA where you go in and you just get allocated a fraction of whatever the JPA decides to do. So this truly is an a la carte approach. So where the efficiencies come in are uh, contracting. So if you're doing RFOs, uh, to the extent that you have one group of people who are putting out the RFO, they have experience in putting this RFO out. So today, we're doing an RFO right now. PC is doing it whenever they're doing it. Uh, Marin's doing it whenever they're doing it. So from a counterparty standpoint too, we may not be getting the best responses uh, because there's only a limited amount of suppliers. Let me give you an example of how, at least my experience of doing it in Southern California through SCAPA. SCAPA would put out an RFP every year for renewable power and you'd have hundreds, sometimes thousands of megawatts of responses. But the supplier community knew the SCAPA RFP came out in a particular schedule, and they knew the process, and there were 13 members behind SCAPA who would basically say, all right, four of us want this solar project. The other three of us want that wind project. And suppliers are very comfortable with it, they are actually able to provide much better pricing. Now, could those four and those three have figured out a bilateral way to do it? Yes, but actually doing that every single time becomes very inefficient, so. Any other questions? Um, I'm sure. Yeah, so in terms of uh, membership levels, the small, medium, and large, is that just in terms of dues paid, or is there actually proportional voting? Yes, it's both. So the way we're looking at this is there will be some kind of minimum cost of the administration of the JPA. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking right up front, we'll probably assign an executive director from one of our staffs who's going to take on that role. It's more like a project manager kind of role. Um, Basic admin costs would be split among everyone based on whether you're small, medium, large. Now, just say we now have a project development agreement for a specific project, say it's a wind project again. The attorney costs for that project, all the consulting consultant costs, we may have financial advisor, blah, 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 all that will be split among the project participants only based on their participation percentage. So participation percentage would be based on your interest. So just say it's a 100 megawatt wind contract. We may say we want 60 megawatts of that. But 60% of all the costs associated with developing that project will flow to us. So there are two levels of cost allocation. One is just the general stuff that's going to be pretty small that everyone shares based on small medium large. And then the remaining is gonna be a participation percentage. And then, when we're 
more questions. Keep going. No, no, no. These are great. Was there um, and, and some thought to the size? So um, I, I don't know how many CCAs there are statewide, but at some point, like you know, it too large that you would. Like, was there, you know, make, being a, making it more like regional or Northern Cal versus Southern Cal or some other type of makeup that might be the optimal size, I guess? That's a good point. Uh, right now, we're opening it to the idea is every CCA is invited. Mm -hmm. We're still a very young organization. Mm -hmm. East Bay, which is going to be the second largest in the state, just started serving power June 1. Mm -hmm. LA just started, mm -hmm. they're, oh, they're going to start in September. It's more in September. September. Uh -huh. uh, they're going to be the largest in the state. Uh -huh. yes. uh -huh. So you do get some benefits from that too. Uh -huh. uh, that concept you talked about has been discussed. Okay. So the, it just depends on who it, it depends. So part of this is We'll see where this goes. Mm -hmm. I think this is the way to go, but we'll see based on interest. Mm -hmm. Maybe there'll be some natural kind of split. Mm -hmm. uh, it could also be that we create this, what we're calling CC power, community choice power, this is Super JPA, and projects may get signed up by a Northern California coalition. Mm -hmm. Some projects may get signed up for by a Southern California coalition. Okay. So that may naturally occur. Uh, but what both the points you've raised, the bilateral concept has been discussed, and should it just be a JPA amongst Northern California entities has also been discussed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything for you, Nancy? I've got a few. I'm happy to go next and if you want. Public well, comment at some time, if there is. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I have a few people to go. Do you want to? Um, Okay, so yeah, let me fire off a few of mine and let's keep this discussion going. Um, so, when you say credit, are you referring to the credit of the super JPA itself or are you saying that the credit of all the agencies involved would, because it, that's a sword that cuts both ways, right? Yeah. It, it, it could raise the credit of individual entities yes. just as easily as it could yes. negatively impact them. Exactly right. So this is definitely a TBD. Yeah. And so this is where the risk reward happens. So, for example, in a JPA such as uh, Northern California Power Agency that I was also involved in, you have step up provisions in your project development agreements. So if one agency goes bankrupt, uh, the other agencies who are part of that project will have to step up their participation shared by 25% to cover that agency's default. So it's called cross-default provisions. Mm -hmm. And you basically, so NCPA has a very good credit rating for their projects because of those cross-default provisions. Mm -hmm. But that's, a, that's something that we have teed up in our comments too. Uh, it could go both ways. And um, I do like the concept that you touched on of kind of regionalizing decarbonization programs and finding a broader collaboration statewide, regionally, in, in very broad terms. Mm -hmm. But how do you address um, one JPA's focus that may be completely on renewables and carbon free versus another one who is completely on cheapest power? We don't really care. How do you manage programs that may have um, input from very diverse mm -hmm. JPAs, yeah, so uh, like CCAs? Airport. So yeah, so this is the a la carte approach. Mm -hmm. It just depends yeah. on what you want. Pay for what you want. Yeah, so uh, over here, I would think that a CCA that's in a different climate zone, maybe then the Inland Empire or Central <coughs> California, may have different kind of efficiency programs than someone who's closer to who's on the coast. Demographics may also play a part, but this is the piece where you enter into enabling it. So that's definitely, it's gonna be a la carte. It just depends on what folks want. You just pick and choose what you want. And if um, CCAs from across the whole state are invited to participate, and let's say you get kind of a piecemeal group of early participants, um, what do you do if 
you see a contract floating out there that looks really interesting. Nobody in the JPA wants to participate, but you find out that Monterey, who chose not to participate, does. Do we bring them in somehow, or do you just go back to the RFO model and write a, con a, a shared agreement with them? Oh, so you're saying if there's a non-member who is interested in buying into a contract, yeah. like in my mind, and I may not understand how it really all works, but yeah. let's say there's a project that's a thousand units, right. and we only need sixty, yeah. and nobody else wants to participate. But let's we'll say that's one other participant yes. does, but Monterey chose not to participate yes. in the Super JPA. Signs, it, raises their hand, and says, "We'll buy the rest of that's it." That's a great question. How do you make them participate? Yeah. Great question. So this is actually happened before. Uh -huh. So I'll give you an NCPA example. So NCPA was building a 280 megawatt combined cycle plant in Lodi. Their members didn't have enough interest to sign up for the entire 280 megawatts. So they got Modesto Irrigation District and California Department of Water Resources to participate through a bilateral agreement. So the ones who are members of NCPA entered into the agreement through the JPA. As a group. As a group. The JPA had created another agreement, which was a bilateral with CDWR and MID, and there was a project development committee and an operations committee which managed that. So essentially, this is governments working together to achieve economies of scale and efficiencies. And if I may add one more yeah. thing to you. It comes to say decar products within our county. I think reaching out to say Palo Alto and Santa Clara, the utilities, mm -hmm. to participate, they I would really doubt they would want to be part of the JPA, but I think they would be quite interested in considering a bilateral arrangement for specific decar kind of products. Because it would probably have money saving opportunities for them. That's right. I assume. Money saving and just economic efficiencies yes. to have the same kind of uh, products that are offered today because their customers are shopping in our territory and vice versa. So, so you gave a specific example of um, wanting to, if, if we appoint our C CEO to serve on the super JPA and that JPA is out shopping for something and we as an individual organization are also shopping for yes. something with the same CEO, how do we make sure that we're not A, competing against ourselves, B, that we're not creating an antitrust or monopoly situation that could endanger all organizations involved? Well, what steps would have to be taken? This may be a legal question more than anything else, but has that been addressed to your satisfaction? So before I ask our attorney to answer that question, I'll give you some examples both at NCPA and SCAPA. Uh, so when I was in Riverside, we entered into contracts for renewable power on our own. For example, we built an eight megawatt uh, solar facility on a landfill site because that's something we wanted. And it was within our city, and so we wanted 100% ownership of it. So we just went ahead and did that. And in other cases, we participated. So we, uh, I laid that out as a risk, as almost theoretical, it's something that could happen. Uh, and the same thing in Northern California Power Agency, uh, especially cities like Palo Alto, which are relatively large within NCPA, they do all their resource procurement themselves. Um, other than less than a month, they do through NCPA. Everything greater than a month, Palo Alto does themselves. NCPA is doing resource procurement for some of their smaller members. At the same time, Palo Alto is out in the market doing resource procurement for themselves. Um, so, theoretically, that is possible. Um, that's why I identified it. So, so my last question really gets back to the way this would be structured. The, the super JPA would require staff, at least a minimum somewhat skeleton staff of some sort. Where would that staff be? Who would manage them? How would they be housed in Santa Clara County, for instance, or would they be downstate? And would that give one JPA, one CCA an unfair advantage? Great question. Uh, so 
answer it a couple of ways. Uh, thought is it's going to be staff driven up front. Maybe we'll get one contractor to help. So, for example, we have a JPA in Northern California called Transmission Agency of Northern California, TAC. Uh, they basically ran for close to 20 years uh, with an executive director. All their staff were a consulting company. And basically, there's a contract with Navigant to the consulting company to do that work. Uh, at SCAPA, uh, a portion of the admin and finance overhead was outsourced to LADWP. LADWP was a giant member, and they basically allocated a certain number of their staff. In in house staff. In house To work on the project and build it. They basically, we actually called them SCAPA LA. Okay. Because we paid for all their costs. Hmm. Because LA had all the systems in place financial systems, etc., to run their show, and we were basically contracting for with them. So we just called them Scapa LA, and it would be a line item, and every year we'd have a arms length negotiation to see what the costs were, you know. So our idea here is to do that kind of model, and that's something that we've actually teed up in some of our comments also. It's like that exact director the first exec director, would that person be a member of staff? Hired independently and yeah, have and an office out in Gilroy yeah. by itself. <laughs> it could be a member itself yeah. uh, having their staff. So it could be, say, Don. Don, <laughs> in addition to your duties here, you're going to manage the agreement. So this is typical in JPAs. You can actually have one member of the JPA administer the agreement. So I'm, I'm, that's exactly why I'm asking because okay. it's happening on some of the JPAs I work with, and there you can argue there is a distinct advantage of having it be your staff member. Yes, you're closer to what's happening. You understand. You're getting real time feedback that yep. that other members may not have access to. Yep. So I'm just curious if that's been addressed or what your thinking is. Yep. You started this idea. Perhaps you get the first shot at. Staffing it? Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> I think more in the midterm, uh, we'd look at hiring a couple of staff yeah. uh, who are, when I, and when I see the scope, it's going to be very much, it's not so, say when you hire a CEO for a CCA, you're looking for some power supply experience, some LNR experience, um, this is going to be more focused to a the operational experience okay. because this person is not going to really work on any legislative and regulatory issues. Mm -hmm. All that's account CCA. This is more of CCA is what do you need to do to manage your own operations? I've got to buy power. I've got to run some programs. How can I do that more efficiently? Can I do it by expanding scale? Okay, I lied. I do have one more question. Um, how do you envision um, yeah, actually, I tell you what. Let me let, let let's move on and let Nancy ask any questions you have, and then we'll open it to public comment and bring it back for discussion. How about that? Thank you, Bernie. Um, so, my um, my questions, I think revolve around it looks to me like um, you threw out a bunch of potential advantages here and I'm wondering if one of these is one or two of these is driving this more than the others so for instance we recently did the, the uh, power purchase agreement um, at our last board meeting and that would fall under the category of, I'm looking on the slide three here, that would fall under, uh, I guess, what, resource adequacy or engage the wholesale power supplies? Wholesale yeah, power The supplies. acquisition of wholesale. Yeah. And we went together with All right. one partner. Correct. And so um, 
is it the case that this JPA would um, be kind of the clearinghouse for contracts of a similar nature and um, kind of do a boilerplate approach to those? That's essentially the way one would do it because you'd standardize the contracts, right? So, so this is how SCAPA has done it, which is, and this is what we tried to do also, right? So when we did our RFO, we had the standard contract attached to the RFO. MC does the same thing, PC does the same thing, but each of us may have a few nuances in there. So I think standardizing contracts as a whole in this business, yeah, we want to do that. Okay, so you're looking at this as a way to quickly engage with more partners as opportunities come up. Yes. And that, the clearinghouse would be the JPA. Yes. And it would help you be more responsive and yep. lend more power to the CCAs quicker. Correct. Okay. On a variety, so wholesale power being one of them, resource adequacy, decal products, the same principle you brought up, right, would be applicable to these different Okay, areas. and so then the membership options, we would be probably a medium or a large, or I mean, uh, I what, think what we are large. We are a large? Yeah, we are right <laughs> on the cusp. Um, huh. It may be, I need to look at the agreement. I, it may be so zero to hundred and hundred to three hundred and then above three hundred. I think the board would want to know. Right. Uh, can you just look it up? Are we medium or large? Um, All right. So our uh, to be large, you have to have revenues and your revenues greater than three hundred million. So we're medium. Okay. We're a large medium. <laughs> are they, uh, I understand that. Are we? Um, are we? Are we actually? Is that too broad of a, like, does it make more sense to tighten it down and be specific to the amount of power you buy and use every year rather than how much your revenues are? If your revenue window is $100 million, that's a big window if you're just barely over. So this is to allocate the amount, uh, the, the common costs, right? And just dealing with. Overall, and so here's the other concept that has been put. If you're a small member, you've got one voting chair for the, for the general votes. If you're a medium, you get two. If you're a large, you get three. So the thing is, what if your Clean Power Alliance, which is the LA County one? You're ginormous, as you're saying? Correct. <laughs> so you could go, if you go with revenues, they may have by going to this approach, you kind of cap their influence. Mm -hmm. On the other side, with small members who maybe they have $30 million revenues, if you go with revenue base, they basically won't have any influence. So this is somewhere in between. Um, I yeah. trust you. Okay. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's okay. So, um, so thanks for bearing with me. So um, essentially, you, how many are there now? 17 operational JPAs. 17, okay. So let's say for round numbers, you have six people that sign, six okay. groups that sign on to the yep. JPA. You have um, maybe 12 votes total. Okay, yep. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. So then you could put forward those opportunities as they come up and then each each, um, it's like America round or a, like a, I'm not thinking of the right. It's like a, it's like, it's like a carousel yeah. with a, like a, like a uh, carnival ride where you can get <laughs> on with the friends. Mm -hmm. You can ride around the, you know, roller coaster with your friends and then you get off the roller coaster. <laughs> then a different set of friends go around. Correct. So it's kind of like yep. that, right? Yep. Okay. But it's yep. one roller coaster. Or whatever. Carousel or roller coaster? Coaster? I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to make sure. It's like, like a pod. So like I drew a little drawing here where you know you have a super JPA and then there's all these different kinds of things and then so then yes. there's the project development agreements. Right. And that's the ticket to. I'm going to get this wrong <laughs> because I didn't grow up in the United States. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> so this. Okay. So that's the ticket to the circular right okay you're just going around then there's another that's the project development agreement one 
another one's the roller coaster. And you're going in with a different set of friends to the roller coaster, and that's a different ticket. But the whole amusement part <laughs> is the super JPA. So to enter the amusement part, you pay a buck. But if you want to go in the circular thingy, you that's $15. You <laughs> get in the circular thingy. Dang. Roller coaster, that's 50 bucks. As long as we get our funnel cake, I think it's all right. <laughs> and the thing is, so there's actually, so getting in, this the general cost. It's just going, that's going to be low. Okay. Just depends on how many people get on the roller coaster. I can't wait to see the minutes. <laughs> We say it responds to your business. It's made by the sports are local. I actually like the drawing in here. Yeah. I'm looking at your notes like this is awesome. It's very good. It's very helpful. It's basically, you know, JPA, so the different. I don't know, five or six different things. Types of types development of agreements. Right, yes, that we have right. available. Yep. Different Sweet. people, uh, different interests. So, you know, I, I think I think some examples of the, you know, thrills that you would get on each ride okay. might be helpful. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> yeah. and then, so I think the cons okay. So moving on to the next, we'll skip ahead. Okay, fine. Yeah, whatever. All right. So um, slide. Let's jump ahead to slide. Uh, oh yeah, right. Three. I don't know. That doesn't seem right. No, okay. Whatever. The value risk. Yes. Okay, so economies of scale, yeah, you have your range of park, shared risks, yeah, okay, you can go the rides, got it, okay. Enhance weaker credit, okay, so the smaller J, the smaller CCAs can get in the park easier, mm -hmm. got it, okay. Lower cost, yeah, okay. Uh, you don't want to each build your own amusement park, get that. The ditto efficiencies, and then a la carte. Yeah, so there's booths and you can go to the whatever. Yep. Yeah. Okay, but once created, you have this amusement park for a very long time. Correct. So I think you mentioned in one of your, um, in the previous slide, the indebtedness issued by the CC Power, which is what you're calling. That's the name. For that's the, the name amusement of, park. of the amusement park. Correct, CC, CC Power. Power. Oh dear. <laughs> um, and so the. Right, so yeah, okay, so then the, the entity itself will be issuing forms of indebtedness. Yes. And then the members will be on the hook for yes. that somehow. And so yep. that makes it okay. Um, okay, um, so these, the risks extended beyond the project commitments. Um, what if somebody falls off the roller coaster? Yeah, I get it. <laughs> That's right. Who pays? Okay, yeah. So would we, I think the question is, you know, what is our risk uh, of being sued and prevailed against would be one question. We being the CC power and we being Silicon Valley Clean Energy. So I think yeah. I think it's helpful to clarify yeah. the risks for, I mean, because you're talking about risks, but I don't see any clarity as to whether it's a CCA risk, um, like us specifically, or the risk to the CC okay. power. Yep. So that distinction would be helpful. Greg, Greg, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. so um, the contracts uh, entered into will be by uh, CC power with uh, other parties. And on those contracts themselves, there's no, there will be no risk to the individual members of the JPA. No, but then with every pro uh, a project participant, there will be, like ourselves, would be a, a project participant pursuant to a contract with the uh, JPA. So uh, there, uh, there could be a financial exposure depending upon how that contract then is structured uh, to our JPA. So, uh, so in general, the firewall of the JPA will apply to all the members, but then uh, the exceptions here would be as you go on a project by project basis, the financial obligations that we can incur will be defined by that contract we have to And that contract will have to be approved by 
uh, by the uh, school board of our JCPA. Okay. Okay. And so then I think finally, um, the the risk of losing the ability to tailor products and services um, is a concern. So in this scenario, what what were the, what are the ways to mitigate? Um, to keep the communityness of our, you know, association here. Yeah, um, I think because this is, we're looking at it more like an a la carte approach. Um, let me give you my experience with this at SCAPA. It's been, Riverside's got everything they wanted. Because essentially what we do is you just put the RFO out and say, if different members want different things, you just list it there and you see what the market is in terms of response. Um, I put this in here again, this being, maybe this is maybe the 5% tailoring, the last 5% gonna be exactly done to our specs. Um, that's maybe it won't be 100% all the time. Whereas if we are running our own RFO, and our scope of services, we can tailor it exactly to what we want. In a way, you know, it's this bigger piece reflects some of the issues we had in our agency too, because the demographics of say the programs that we may offer in Mountain View may be different than the programs we are offering in Morgan Hill and Gilroy. So we're gonna have to do a menu of options that different folks can actually take advantage of. And it'll be the same case over here. Okay, so the way you're talking is that this risk will be mitigated by yes. the a la carte approach, yes. and that the risk will be somewhat limited um, to maybe the finer points of the yep. All right, that's it for me. Okay, I do know one more. Yeah, th this gets into sort of the more touchy-feely relationship here, what happens if the CEO, as much change as we're seeing, as fast as these CCAs are growing, and the C CEO is appointed by its board to go and serve um, on that group, um, is there a risk, and I'm asking you to take off your individual hat for a minute and look at it from the perspective of Silicon Valley Clean Energy, is there a risk that we lose our CEO in a uh, weekend meeting where everybody gets together and suddenly job offers are being yeah. flown around and uh, people are being hired away from one another? Yeah. Um, and and I, 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 I know I, that sounds sort of funny, but at the same yeah. time, I, I want to be very careful about that. So I'll tell you that, that from a personal standpoint, I don't think you have to worry. Uh, but I'll give you an example since I've been giving you so many examples of my experience here. <laughs> the general manager in Riverside from 1986 to 2000 got hired to be the executive director of SCAPA. Um, and he stayed as the executive director of SCAPA through 2016. Uh, again, you know, that could happen. Um, we are already seeing a movement uh, between CCAs, not just at the CEO level, but other levels too. Uh, so we start to see some moving around. Well, I definitely don't want to bury, you know, be a silo, but at the yeah. same time, I want to be, you know, this is definitely a risk we run here. If I may offer up, so this is, to me, I say this whole thing, it's not a perfect mousetrap. It's just, can we create better mousetraps to get more efficiency? One way of looking at this is always a flip side of every risk. Like, you have other layers. So what if Monica, Dennis is walking out end of this week. What if Monica gets hired somewhere else? Uh, now you have no one really in power supply other than one analyst. To the extent that you have some group that's doing wholesale power supply, 
in a way that's your second level of defense. Safety net. Yeah. But that's a safety net outside, so that's the other side of it. There's a risk that we make. Here's the other thing that's well, we, we're free to hire there too. It, actually, what you said, it's a great point. We would look at SCAPA and look at NCPA and their salaries <laughs> and say, what's the competition there? And there was always from a staff level, it was on both sides, looking at the cities and the cities looking at the JPSA. They don't do much and they get paid a lot. <laughs> but, but isn't it also true that a smaller JP, a smaller CCA might feel like, why would I want to participate if I'm at risk of losing my CEO because he's, he or she's going to the meeting and find out that he could make he or she could make three hundred thousand dollars more by working for a medium yeah. or large one. That could happen even without even participation. Without, Participation's course, not going to change anything. You're right. I think actually, but your other point you raise, smaller. JPAs would tend to depend more on the super JPA because they don't have the staff to actually create their own kind of tailored resource plans or decarbonization plans. What happens when you start suing one another over something unrelated to, I mean, I can't imagine what, I hope I can't. So that's a point that Greg has actually, we've put uh, dispute resolution, the right. way it was set up, so dispute resolution that's, you know, before you get to suing, you gotta work with each other before you get there. Even if the issue is outside of the Super JPA? Uh, no, just Super JPA. No. Greg, would you yeah. talk to that, please? Yeah, we would, we're we gonna be working out a dispute resolution provision only for disputes within the, within the uh, JPA itself among its members. You're talking about If you, if, if Silicon Valley Clean Energy had some sort of dispute with um, Marin, Marin and we had to end up in a lawsuit and yet we were still in bed okay. together as a part of the super JPA how, how does that work out um, so it just does it just does because <laughs> it, yeah it's um, it's like you've had the kids and you're despite not being married anymore you're still raising the same kids uh, the city of Roseville wanted to get out of the NCPA JPA because of some technical issues with uh, there's some technical issues with change the markets in 2004 and they weren't getting as much value and they wanted to get out of a bunch of these NCPA allocated costs and NCPA and the other members didn't want that to happen uh, so there was a lot of these discussions happening at the staff level between the JPA and executive management at the city of Roseville and between the politicians. Because the politicians had to wear the JPA hat and had to wear their city hat as the city of Roseville yeah, too. Okay. Uh, so it became tense for a while, for about a year and a half or so. Uh, but at the same time, business had to run, you still had to provide power and you just kept working through it. Any other questions? I mean, I, I've been rapid firing them. I feel like we've covered a bunch. Uh, any any other questions from members of the public? Bruce? Yep. I do have a couple of comments. First of all, I'm very heartened that SCAPA and NCPA have already used this model, so it's, it's a tested model. Um, there are the other two things that are possible, so just keep going it alone, and bilateral agreements. There's a fourth opportunity, or fourth possibility that's worth thinking about, and I'm going to reflect back to when AT&T was the phone company, and it was broken up into seven regional Bell operating companies, Pacific Bell here, 9X on the other coast. What happened over time was those seven coalesced until they reformed essentially the one giant. So now here we are in a state with 17 new CCAs, more on the horizon, one of them, Lancaster, has essentially turned itself into a baby super JPA mm -hmm. with the California Community Energy Authority, where they're going around to smallish cities and saying, you couldn't do this on your own, but you could do it together with us. And so who knows how far they will get with that. But the thought that occurs to me is perhaps there will be some geographical <coughs> merging that SBCE and PCE over time will come together. 
Um, one reason why that might happen is for economies of scale. Another is uh, the realization that um, you know, the way that county lines happen to have been drawn doesn't really affect the way our economy works. Um, even those community choice organizations like East Bay that have put a lot of focus on we want local development of renewable energy resources in some of their public comments seem to be saying, well, not so much. You know, local doesn't necessarily mean Oakland or uh, Alameda County. It could mean, you know, Contra Costa, you know, closer to where the sun shines in Central Valley. And I think over the next couple of years, what local or community means isn't about where you get the power, but where you deliver the program. So Amy's programs will be the thing that people know us for. That you can get a heat pump water heater through SVCE and maybe you can't get it from PG&E. Um, it's, it's, all of that's opt-in, right? So the opt-out was easy compared to all the opting in that's gonna have to happen uh, to really drive decarbonization uh, and beneficial electrification. So I'm, I'm supportive. Uh, I think it's really important to understand how to keep costs coming down faster than PG&E can drive our costs up through their lobbying. Uh, and also drive their own costs down through better procurement. Um, ultimately, we're all going to get to the same place where our energy is very, very green, and so it becomes a price competition. Uh, and of course, and there's all the direct access risks as well that need to be managed. Lower prices uh, seem to be the way to you know, keep the direct access wolf away from the door. So uh, I think since there's a great model and um, it's, it's a flexible model, that this is something that I and, and others in the advocacy community would happily support. Great. Any other comments from anybody else? All right. So what are you looking for from us today? First, you've given me great questions. I'm thinking I'm going to convert this into an FAQ to basically take all the questions that you've asked, just list them as Q&A. Um, I'd like to bring it to the to the board and just I, I, I need more info because this is before we join another organization while we are still new I think there needs to be some seat time but we need to balance it against the risks and opportunities we have on us right now whether it's the green book risk resource adequacy Legislative. Yeah. Legislative. So it's balancing those mm -hmm. two. I can't tell you that there aren't any risks here, but I think the risk can be mitigated. Uh, so next steps, I'll create an FAQ. Uh, definitely get it back to you in September because in July, we're not going to have, I think, like four or five of the regular board members and uh, folks who are yeah. the, we're going to have alternates. Uh, and something like this, which also have policy implications, uh, I may want to bring it back in September. So I could bring it in July. This is an internal staff thing, just in terms of getting the packet out. Um, definitely in September, uh, and get your input. Uh, and maybe September, October, November. That's right. I've left it open a little bit. Uh, Greg and I and Monica are going to be working with other CCAs. Other CCAs will have some overlapping questions. Maybe we'll get some insights. Maybe some changes to this, what we're proposing. So. I summarized to the best of my ability um, at least 13 key questions that we ask. I may have missed a couple, but I'd be happy to share those notes if you uh, want to just double check and make sure we got Fantastic. them all. Um, but um, I do I do think, I'm glad you're not asking for um, any sort of approval right now, because it de definitely feels like this is a lot to um, encumber ourselves with. I'm not, I, I just feel like uh, as a board, this is going to take a lot of discussion. We're just a big group, and we may even want to schedule some sort of workshop around this okay. and discuss it um, outside of a board meeting. Um, still public, but in a way where we can really focus on just this topic and its full ramifications. So that would be my suggestion, is looking at how we perhaps schedule a day to really sit down and get our heads around this as yeah. a group and what this what this yeah. could mean, both positively and negatively. That sounds great. So I think given that other CCAs are going to be providing comments over the next few weeks, 
I think we're better off if we wait to September for the next time. Fantastic. Not much point. I mean, you've given us so many great questions to think about. So we'll bring it back in September. Super. Great. Okay, then that, with, that, with that, we're going to move on to agenda item number two, strategic plan review for discussion. Yes. All right, everybody. I'll be taking Thank off the line now. Happy Thank Fourth you. of July. Thank you. Yeah, you too. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. That's like this. So you approved uh, our current strategic plan last year, and it was intended to be a living document. And I looked at this coming in. It's uh, a part of the document is outward facing and customer facing. And there's a lot of the document that's more inward facing. I'm fine with that. Being a new agency, it's good from a transparency standpoint for even some of those inward facing things to be, everyone sees it. I'm good with that. Uh, a few of the goals and tactics need to be updated, timelines, etc. Uh, so the way we frame this update to you is we have some minor changes, some major changes, and a couple TBD. We know we have to do it, but we don't know what the change actually is going to be. Um, we, as we looked at this internally, we kind of thought if the previous strategic plan was 1.0, this is like the 1.1 update. Uh, so it's, it's, it's more of a fine tuning update than a major update, which we hope to bring back to you by the end of the calendar year or the beginning of next calendar year so you can use that updated strategic plan to drive budget workshops that we'll have more of like springtime that will inform our budget for the year after, things like these. So in your packet, we have the actual strategic plan with a red line copy of the changes. And uh, I am highlighting here for you, if you are looking at the actual packet itself, it's probably better to look at the red line version so you can see the changes. Um, under workplace, which is the first major category, this is attachment number two. We've removed some outdated figures and the only major change is to conduct a compensation study. Um, previously, there was a tactic which says it said annually update the compensation schedule, but it didn't actually talk about undertaking the compensation study that would inform getting the schedule updated. So, do you think it needs to be done biannually? That's every two years. I think once every two years is fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if that's not even too often, but I I don't know. I don't do these. Yes. Reasonable. Okay, With good. all the changes in the industry. I, it seems. Yeah. Okay, good. Because I mean, to your, I mean, sorry, but to your question earlier about how do you make sure you know, you know the JP? Yeah, I mean, I think that there'd be um, there's an effect to that uh, in the industry now that the smaller JPAs will be a pipeline to get more people in the in the workforce. Right. Just, I think that there is a lot of growth opportunity in the NSM industries. Yeah. Okay, I'm good with it. Well, I just, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, I agree, it seems like a lot, um, like really often. It seems it's pretty often. Do it too. But you are probably hiring an outside party to do this survey, this yeah. study? Yeah, okay. I like what we're doing right now. Okay, we, yeah. With Bryce Consulting doing it. I think once every two years, you kind of, there's a moving average kind of thing. Other people change at different times. Two years, I think, is a, it's a good goal. Okay, great. Right. Right. Uh, Next, sorry to interrupt. Uh, customer and community, which has um, goals number two through five. Uh, we wanted to make some minor changes uh, in terms of the timeline on customer awareness. Uh, decolonization program roadmap and GHG inventory data. Uh, the major changes is to create an SVEP 
SBC Customer Resource Center and establish a Innable Data Analytics Platform. Uh, the TBD next update, what we need to do is, and this is uh, a major one, so when we, it gets together with the roadmap and what we've done with the CPAG and the MOG coming together. So the initial strategic plan said, uh, let's, well, you see the quotes, goal number five. It basically goes through 2021. This roadmap is going to go through 2025 and 2030. So this is what we're going to bring to you in September with an initial roadmap and December with a more detailed roadmap. Uh, to me, that's really going to drive a lot. And like Bruce Carney said earlier, each of us are going to be known by our programs, um, especially in the Bay Area. A lot of us are going to be in different flavors of close to 100% renewable, carbon free, just very close flavors. But I think our programs will distinguish ourselves. And this bending the carbon curve through doing this, that's the big deal. Uh, I also wanted to give you a heads up and maybe get a little bit of reaction on this. Is I've been talking to Rocky Mountain Institute, and Rocky Mountain Institute is probably the leading innovator in the country and world on decarbonization. I've been talking to them to bring them in end of September to conduct a two-day workshop uh, between about 40 to 50 people. So we'll bring you the initial roadmap and then get all these folks together. So we're talking about folks like contractors, plumbers, some of the CPAC folks, some of the mall folks, some folks from academia, to basically come in and what is our flagship program that we are looking at, our flagship initiative that makes SVCE different. So that's going to, I'm going to bring it in to the July meeting. It's going to be about a $50,000 contract uh, for approval so that we can get started. There's a lot of work involved to set up such a meeting uh, that would be effective. So that's on customer and community. Um, those are the changes. Finance and fiscal uh, responsibility. It's the timeline for achieving a investment grade weighting and uh, we have changed the annual five-year net revenue update to a biannual update. Uh, so we're going to create a five-year pro forma and previously we said the plan we provided to you once a year. We're going to do it twice a year. Uh, Nancy, I think yes. I have a question. So um, you mentioned that you also changed, um, I think it would be transparent to also state that you shortened the forecast from 10 years to five years. Okay, yes. So, you know, why, okay, so it's I like- I think the thought was after the, f after the first five years, numbers get a little fuzzy. Fuzzy anyway. And not a lot, not a lot of reliability there, however, Curious to hear what the well, Sunnyvale does it out 20 years, so that's why I'm asking. So I can tell you, so let me give you a bit of a picture on this. It's not like we won't be analyzing 10 years. So when you look at the Risk Oversight Committee, we'll be providing uh, some updated reports. So there are certain reports which look at uh, the risk through expiration of all our contracts. So to the extent we have some contracts that go out 15 and 20 years, we will have the risk that goes out those entire 20 years. But when you look at, that's not a very good metric yeah. to tell you what do you need to do in the next year. So it's actually multiple metrics that will be provided. From a big picture, looking at rates and reserves, five years I think is a very good number to have. 10 years is like too much. But we will have our resource plans, for example. You'll be seeing the IRP at the next meeting. That goes out 12 years. So we will be having other analyses that go out longer term. But this particular one, which shows rates and reserves and the interplay between them. Right? And, and to your point, most of the power supply and the largest cost is in that five year. Uh, well, I think, I mean, and also if you're doing it, if, if you're increasing the frequency of doing the forecasting, it's reasonable to short. Um, 
So, let's take a look at this. Then going to next one, regulatory and uh, legislative. We are making a couple of changes in here to emphasize Cal CCA taking an active role and uh, versus when we first put this together, there was actually a lot more of how we would be almost an extension of Cal CCA staff, uh, which is what Hillary has been doing. And now Beth, the executive director, has hired two people uh, already uh, in the last 30 days, and she's expected we've just approved a budget for her to hire at least two more. Next, power supply. We've updated some timelines for the energy storage and RPS goals. In terms of major changes, so these are some of the things that have come from uh, Monica's input uh, here. It's, and this is where the first one, strategy 9.3, looking at cost-effective local distributed energy resources, we're looking at issuing an RFO for local power in fall. Goal 11, manage power supply resources and risk of financial and great objectives. This gets back to what we talked about at the last board meeting about what is our reserve policy? I mean, we need to have a reserve policy which says something like, okay, are you having this reserve so that you can keep rates stable for a year or two? And so that actually, when you work backwards from that objective, you can figure out how much, what kind of hedging strategy The next one, level for optimize resources to increase value to customers, evaluate opportunities to minimize cost of procuring, scheduling related products. That's a combination of taking in some of those tasks that we currently outsource, take on some of those within our stand, and if the CC power uh, becomes a reality, some can be outsourced to them. And 11.2 is similar, you know, it's basically, let's manage our portfolio to a rate and reserve goal. And this has come up at some rock meetings where yeah. the question has come like, how do you come up with that band for each year? The bands actually, if you look across municipal utilities, they look pretty much what most people do, but there needs to be a rationale behind it, and that's what Next is IT, um, and this is maybe John. Do you want to speak? It's all red. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, and that. That's, that, the difference being that before the first one and now we actually hired an IT guy. <laughs> 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 yeah. It's all red. <laughs> 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 Didn't stay at the Holiday Inn last night. <laughs> so um, anyway, there's. Uh, most of those changes really emphasize what we originally had in there, which is reliability of the system and security of the system. And so, what Nick added to this uh, to the strategic plan is just more is supports those two objectives. Uh, so that's the end of my presentation. Uh, I'd like to frame this one too. As, so this is more of a 1.1 update. Uh, we'll make a few more, especially the decarb goals is going to pull together every department here is going to have a stake in that 2025 and 2030 goal. It's like how does it impact our supply? How does it impact our finances? Uh, so that's going to be an exciting piece to it. Questions from anyone at the table here? We kind of asked them as we went along. And I read through it and I have my one question, so I think it looks good. Mm -hmm. I, the only um, question I'd like to ask, which may be completely out of line, um, but on item goal number two, maintain competitive rates to acquire and retain customers. Um, it's been a long standing question of mine and perhaps just an inability to understand the entire industry, but I would still like to understand why we're not examining customized rate options for all customers. Um, 
and, and sort of looking at what options we have for pricing uh, relative to cost rather than relative to PG&E's rates, um, where, where I think we could really change the market altogether. Um, but I don't know if that's... I would like to, if I may answer that, yeah. I would like to bring that back as part of a broader discussion uh, when, I, when we look at this five-year pro forma. So let me tell you, some of the things we are planning on doing of customized weight option is for large customers. Uh, we already have some customers who are interested in, say, uh, just something different for themselves. So we are looking at the large customers first. Your point of it being more cost-based, you know, bottom-up versus top-down, right. I think both have to be factored in. Especially when it comes to large customers, there may be customized options we can give them which don't involve as much as a, of a margin as we have today. Yeah. Uh, we don't have the models today and the staff to do what you're, what you're looking for. One of the discussions that Don and Amy, Amy second day here today, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so actually in our next budget, so I've already, so this is a little bit off topic. I told you in, the, in my assessment that I expect that we'll have 25 employees in the next 12 months. This budget proposal that we plan to get you will have 25. Uh, part of it is I'm gonna wanna add two people to Don's shop, and then you have Amy having two, and Monica's gonna have one. Where do rates go? So right now, Don does rates, but rates become a tool for whether it's efficiency or even retention. And Amy's group is going to also get involved in data analytics. Great. So that's where the two of them have to talk a little bit more about how you can create that. But it looks like they want to say something too. Well, <laughs> just uh, <laughs> complete, complete agreement. And, I, and Amy and I, in a day and a half, in, in the precious few hours we've had so far, we've talked about things like uh, an all electric tariff, for instance. And there, there is such a thing today. Uh, it's not well understood. Uh, I'm not sure it's even well implemented. But could we incentivize customers who build all electric buildings uh, to, you know, with a lower rate? Um, same thing with EV charging. Could we incentivize EV charging during the middle of the day when power is cheap and mm -hmm. you know solar power is plentiful? There are a lot of things we can do with with providers or with with in a sense, uh, additions to the rate or subtractions from the rate that I think could be really creative and maybe actually easier to implement than whole scale rate changes because you always get winners and losers when you do that. Sure. Whereas this way we can we can kind of control exactly who it is we want to win by exhibiting exactly what sort of behavior. If Amy, if you want to pile on or add your own thoughts. Uh, yeah, I completely uh, agree and I think it's a really um, special opportunity for CCAs uh, in particular to lead in this area, given that we aren't uh, as restrained as public utilities for when it comes to rate design. So if it's a rate design when it was at Palo Alto, and there were certainly um, a lot of uh, rules regarding uh, cost of service, base rates, et cetera. So we have, I think, a little bit more flexibility there, but I'm st still in day two here. <laughs> so, and actually, Don and I will be at PG&E tomorrow uh, for an all-day uh, rate update for pg &E. So I'm really hoping to dive in there to understand like really the extent of the flexibility we have and to and brainstorm different ideas. But I think it's just, yeah, it will be a very beautiful area. I have a suggestion is we could put it in the next update piece just to highlight the concept of examining rates as a strategic tool, but Terrific. also looking at cost base. We'll add that as a uh, to me, it's a it's a fundamental component that of our business and a fundamental opportunity. Like you said, we're in a unique position and um, could actually change. I, mean, I think it's an outrage that PG&E has how many 179 rate structures. That's ridiculous. You know, you, you, that this ought to be clean. We could clean it up and do it our way. Um, but that that's just a newbie coming in and saying, why not? So I'd love to see it added. 
Anything else? Any comments from you, Bruce? I do. Could you go back to the slide where you talked about the 2021, 2025, yeah. 2030 right. goals? So as part of the work in Mountain View, I looked at the climate action plans from all the cities in Santa Clara County. And typically, cities have a goal for 2020, 2030, and 2050. And those surprisingly look like a straight line to an 80% reduction in the starting year. So what they don't have is goals for nine out of 10 years. And yet, any meaningful climate change goal is going to be really hard to reach. And so what does it mean to not have a goal for 2022, 2023, 2024? Well, it means that people will infer that you do have a goal by drawing a straight line between 2021 and 2025. But straight lines are the wrong way to incentivize a reduction that can actually be achieved. Um, the method that should be used is a constant percentage reduction year over year. So 4% better this year than last year, not a constant quantity amount. Because when you get out to the, the 2040s, those constant quantities are enormous percentages. They're unachievable if you've been picking the low-hanging fruit as you've gone along. In fact, one could make the argument that the percentages should be higher in the early years and lower in the, the late years. But let's leave that argument aside. I think you should have a goal for every single year, and that those goals should decline by a constant percentage year over year to get to the ultimate end state that the state requires and that you want to achieve. And the other thing I would say in the context of these goals being really hard to achieve, so what's the consequence of not achieving them? Is it like, oh, too bad, we tried. I know it's so hard, we tried so hard. Mm, not, that's, that's not the saving the climate consequence. So I think it's important to think about what will your consequence be? Uh, it shouldn't involve a guillotine, but there should be something that you've thought about ahead of time that you can implement if you don't make your goal, and some sort of reward that you can implement if you overachieve your goal. But first, you need to have a goal for every year. Otherwise, things will, will go awry. Thank you very much. I have a comment about that. I got schooled by James Talea on that one. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's called the decay curve, which mm -hmm. you probably didn't want to say, but yeah. Anyway, I have heard this before. Great minds. <laughs> Overall comments of that, I agree with it conceptually. The devil's in the details in each one of them, whether it's the faithful performance. I think you're talking about Bruce, but what Don brought up the last time, or it's also performance incentives for our contractors on how they actually achieve uh, different goals. I think that's being innovative in our contracting would also be something we look at. Um, so going forward, this is why creating this model, which is what Amy's gonna do in this roadmap, it is a financial, market-based, it's all the groups working together to figure out what that curve's going to look like. And now's when we're getting into the difficult part. The cleaning up the electricity, as difficult as it was, that was the easy part. This is the difficult part. So, Don. I was going to say, at our board meeting in July, we're going to be going through the results of the, of the GHG assessments for 2015 and 2017. So we're actually going to have a baseline number, which we didn't have when we wrote this. We're going to see how much we decreased GHGs across transportation and the built environment in those two years. So we're going to see the impact of SVCE. We also have baseline information on how many EVs we have in our service territory versus how many EVs, <laughs> how much solar, et cetera. So we're going to have right. a good good starting point to, right. to begin to build this great. And if let me go back to what I said earlier. So when we go into this two-day workshop with RMI, this isn't going to be a workshop where people just come in unprepared. The work of the CPAG is going to get summarized. We're going to take the juice out of that. The inventory and other work, there's going to be pre-work. Amy's already talked about we may have not only pre-work of what we've done so far, people are going to have to come prepared. Also a webinar before that. And then you actually have those two days. So thoughts, 
what are those goals and how are you going to achieve it? Yeah. That's where we really get together. I've seen enough goals created. Where if the goals are out in 2023, who cares? I'm not going to be around 2023, right? <laughs> you better be. Yeah. No, but that's the thing. <laughs> it's, it's today plus six years. You know, X plus six years. It's like people do the straight line thing so often. And I think we have an opportunity yeah. using some modeling and community input. Yeah. Let's mash it up into something yeah. reasonable. Super. So I plan, if I plan on bringing this to the board as a discussion item in July. I think it'll be valuable for us as we put the final touches to the budget. Uh, I think a couple of resource chains, I've talked to you about this, I'll also bring the RMI contract in. July and also give the board a bit of a heads up in July what's on the staff. Staffing. Yeah. Okay. Super. What else you got? What, anything else? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any staff or committee staff remarks? Oh. I actually had a question. Oh, yeah. So um, I'm on the air. District, did, yeah. you, did you receive notice yes. about 325,000? Yes, we did. Okay. Right. We, yeah, we sent an so, email uh, to the whole board. It actually was in the right, right. So yeah, the CEO yeah. report, and uh, yeah, we're very happy to receive three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. And uh, you know, Don and the staff are working on bringing it back to accept the grant. We're also reaching out to the city of Palo Alto, who received yes. several grants Thank to see um, what collaboration. And I believe we're going to be meeting with Pacman staff. In a little right. bit. I think after uh, the week of July 9th, I think. Yeah. Uh, about the grant support. I know we had created the, the meeting already just I mean, for overall done. opportunities right. of mobility. Yes. Yes. Just uh -huh. like let's get yeah. together and see well, what we can do together. What's happening in the EV world? Yes. Stations and rebates and stuff like yeah. that. So, so we, we have MTC and Pacman. It's a joint meeting. Okay. Any other staff or committee questions or comments? Uh, with none, I will adjourn this meeting. Did we get out by two? Not quite. Right. You did pretty close. Sorry about that. It was great.